Welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm, my name is Peter Bergen. It's my pleasure to host uh, two very good friends of the New America Foundation. One is Dr. John Nagel, who of course has a new book out, Knife Fights, which uh, was reviewed as it happens by Daniel Green, Dr. Daniel Green, who had never met Nagel until today uh, and wrote this, uh, wrote this uh, spectacular review uh, uh, in foreign policy uh, for what is clearly a spectacular book. Uh, Dr. Nagel is uh, the, the ninth headmaster of the Haverford School in Philadelphia. He was previously the president of the Center for New American Security. He's a uh, Rhodes Scholar, uh, amongst other things. He's written a previous book, How to, uh, How to Eat Soup with a Knife. Uh, and Dr. Green is a defense fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, uh, author of the new book, Fallujah Redux, The Anbar Awakening and the Struggle for Al-Qaeda, Struggle with Al-Qaeda. Um, <laughs> And he's a uh, military veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Nagel was also a retired Lieutenant Colonel who served in Anbar as well. So um, Dr. Nagel is going to uh, spend about 20, 30 minutes outlining the big themes and stories in the book. And uh, Dr. Green is going to respond to that. And then we're going to have a moderated Q&A involving everybody in the audience. So John. Peter, thank you. I, I, will, I promise I won't go that long. Thanks to everybody for coming out. Thanks to New America for hosting this. Thanks to Peter Bergen for his intellectual leadership on these issues. One of the books I taught from at the Naval Academy when I had the privilege of being the Minerva professor there was Peter's The Longest War, uh, which, which I think um, picks up where Steve Call's Ghost Wars left off uh, and is the best intellectual history we have to date of the long war against Al Qaeda. Um, uh, I wrote this book. Uh, with, with two hopes, really. One of them uh, was that the United States would fight fewer wars in the future, uh, and the other hope was that when the United States did fight wars in the future, it would do so more intelligently, less badly, more wisely, less cost of human life. And I dedicated the book to 23 soldiers from my task force who were lost in the fighting in Al Anbar in 2004. Um, veterans, as I say uh, at the end of the book, of a war that did not need to be fight, need, did not need to be fought, uh, that was not fought as well as it should have been, um, but but they were they were good soldiers, uh, to quote uh, David Finkel's book, and um, deserved a better war. Um, the the book starts with with my first war with Operation Desert Storm. I led a tank platoon in Operation Desert Storm in 1991 uh, in the first CAV, and uh, um, a great little war. We took the Iraqi army from the fourth largest in the world to the second largest in Iraq mm -hmm. in, a, in a period of 100 hours. And I, I thought that's the way war was supposed to be. Right? Ta tank on tank, we shoot the tanks that don't look like ours, uh, defeat mm -hmm. them rapidly, uh, and, and uh, declare victory, and go home. And then almost exactly a year after the, the fighting, the, the tank on tank fighting of Desert Storm, I got to participate in a simulated battle at the US Army's National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California a place where we, we simulate tank fighting against other tanks with the world's most expensive game of laser tag. Hmm. Uh, a great, uh, a, a wonderful investment in technology. It's, it's designed to make sure that the Army is prepared for the next war. We, we, we in this particular fight, we're defending a, a, a large piece of desert. We backed up to mountains, which tanks can't get through, and, and dug our tanks in an enormously difficult, time-consuming process. We got all the tanks dug in. And just as we finished that process, we were attacked from the rear uh, by, by uh, insurgent fighters, guerrillas, um, uh, fighting us with mortars, with light anti-tank weapons from a direction we hadn't expected, a, a mode of attack we were not prepared to take on. And uh, a tank company of the US Army was defeated in detail by an enemy it couldn't see and hadn't prepared to fight. An enormously frustrating experience. And I, I, I got home. And, and thought about those two experiences, cutting through an enemy tank force like a hot knife through butter, uh, and, and then a year later being defeated in detail by light forces, infantry forces. And I, I wrote uh, a piece about that, uh, uh, published as a tale of two battles in Armor Magazine, a, a widely read. Uh, <laughs> 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 among certain people. Uh, among, <laughs> among, <laughs> among a certain small <laughs> group of people. Uh, <laughs> magazine, and, and uh, after, um, continued to, to struggle with those questions, with those issues. And, and uh, when the Army decided to send me uh, back to Oxford for my second tour there to get my PhD, because we all make sacrifices for national security, 
I, I decided to look not at the tank on tank kind of warfare. I'd, I'd fought successfully in Desert Storm, but I, I think you learn, learn more from a defeat than a victory. I decided to look at the kind of warfare where I'd been defeated in detail by light infantry force, by, by guerrillas and insurgents. And, and so, uh, as Peter said, I, I went to Oxford and, and wrote my doctoral dissertation comparing the, the process by which the British Army learned to conduct counterinsurgency in the Malayan emergency with the way the U.S. Army failed to do so uh, fast enough uh, in the Vietnam War. And I, I titled that piece uh, after a, um, an observation by T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, that war upon rebellion is messy and slow, like eating soup with a knife. And I actually read that phrase in, in Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom. A triumph, I'd been for a run, uh, was, in the was in the tub, uh, reading Seven Pillars of Wisdom, eating strawberries, mm. drinking champagne. It's Oxford, that's what you do there. And, and uh, hit, the hit that phrase and, and knew I had the title of my dissertation. And, and finished in, in 1997, uh, what I'm proud to say is the best and ashamed to say is the worst doctoral dissertation written on counterinsurgency in the 1990s mm. because it was, of course, the only one. Tried to get it published uh, afterwards while I was a, a professor in the social department at West Point, uh, unable to do so. Uh, literally, uh, rejection letters from, from university presses asked me why I was writing about a subject with so little contemporary relevance uh, and why didn't I look at something. Uh, that people would be a little more interested in. Uh, was, was not able to get it published until after the attacks of September 11th when suddenly insurgency and terrorism were very much in vogue and, and got it published in 2002 uh, with a preface describing uh, U.S. Army Special Forces riding horseback uh, calling in airstrikes against Taliban forces after the attacks of September 11th. Having written the book, I went and did the research uh, in Al Anbar province of Iraq, 2003, 2004, um, and, and found that counterinsurgency, which I thought was messy and slow and really, really hard, was harder and messier and far more difficult than I'd ever imagined. Uh, my task force lost 23, had 150 wounded fighting in Al Anbar in a town named Chaldea, tough little town uh, right in between the towns that you may have heard of, of Ramadi, the provincial capital, and Fallujah. Uh, um, both of them are now in the hands of ISIS insurgents, as is Chaldea, the town for which we fought so very hard. Enormously grinding, difficult year. Uh, we got back from Iraq to Fort Riley, Kansas, and my battle captain printed up coffee mugs that said Iraq 2003-2004. We were winning when I left. Right. And, and we weren't. And we knew it. And I went from there to, uh, to the Pentagon to work for Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz which was a big change from Iraq. Wait for it. At least in Iraq, I'd had some idea who I was fighting against. <laughs> right? and, and you hope, you really hope, when you're on the ground uh, fighting a grinding, protracted war, as we were, that somebody somewhere has a plan and it's all going to work out. And, and that was not exactly what I found when I got to the Pentagon. Uh, what I, who I, the, the person I did find was David Petraeus. Captain David Petraeus had been one of my teachers at West Point. Uh, now Lieutenant General Petraeus returning from his second tour in Iraq to take command of the Army's Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, with responsibility for Army doctrine. Uh, talked to, to Petraeus about, uh, had the chance to talk to him a little bit during one of his visits to Wolfowitz's office, and, and suggested to him that the Army really needed to write, its new counter, to write a new counterinsurgency field manual, which we hadn't done in 25 years. Uh, he thought that was a great idea. Uh, said he knew just the guy to do it. Uh, and told me to do it. Um, I ended up being sort of the managing editor of that project, a man named Conrad Crane, who had been Petraeus's West Point classmate, Stanford PhD in history, wonderful man, uh, um, pulled the team together that, that turned that manual and wrote it over the course of the year 2006. Uh, the, uh, and, and many people in the room uh, helped with that process. Um, the, the rogues gallery in the... Uh, uh, <laughs> right in the back. Yeah, right, way in the back where they belong. <laughs> Uh, were, were, were some of the people uh, who, who helped write that manual. Um, published on December 15th, 2006. Uh, downloaded a million and a half times in the next month. Translated and critiqued on jihadi websites. Copies found in Taliban training camps in Pakistan. So we knew our enemies were reading it. We just had to get our guys to do that. <laughs> right? Part of that process involved getting it published by the University of Chicago Press, uh, which, which sent a copy to The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Uh, where, where I had the privilege of having 
the funniest conversation John Stewart has ever had about an Army field manual <laughs> on camera. <laughs> Confident when I tell you that. Um, the the um, sort of extraordinary experience of, of David Petraeus having, having spent uh, a concerted year deeply involved in the writing, um, thinking through how he would fight the war in Iraq if he got the chance to go back and take over, uh, followed by uh, uh, sort of writing that plan out and, and then being given the chance to execute it. Um, George W. Bush at exactly this point in, uh, in his administration, six years into his administration, uh, decided to make uh, some of the boldest decisions of his entire presidency, uh, replacing his Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, with Bob Gates, in my eyes the best Secretary of Defense the country has ever had, uh, replacing George Casey with, with David Petraeus in command in Iraq, against the advice of pretty much everybody, surging 30,000 troops into Iraq in early 2007, extending the, the uh, combat tours of, of all of those soldiers and those already there, to the Army soldiers, to 15 months. Um, and, and Petraeus implemented this classic clear hold and build counterinsurgency strategy to good effect, um, reducing violence by, by two thirds to three quarters over the course of the 18 months he was in command in Iraq. And uh, Napoleon said, all my generals are good, give me ones who are lucky. I would argue that Petraeus was both lucky and good. Uh, he, he took advantage of, nurtured uh, the Sawa, the awakening, uh, not the first attempt by uh, Sunni tribes to rebel against Al Qaeda in Iraq, uh, but the first one that was supported widely uh, by, by the Americans and the, the first one uh, that, that had the horsepower to succeed. Uh, tragically, uh, at the uh, end of, um, of uh, our, our second war in Iraq, uh, against the advice of uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's director of the Central Intelligence, by now David Petraeus, his Secretary of Defense, uh, by now, uh, uh, Secretary Panetta, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, about as good a national security team as you're going to find. Uh, President Obama decided to pull all the American troops out of Iraq uh, with, with predictably grave results, and we see that now uh, with ISIS in control of the, the ground that uh, my men, my friends, uh, fought for, bled for. Uh, an entirely predictable, entirely preventable series of events. Um, I, I spent a bunch of time uh, thinking uh, in the book about Afghanistan as well. A Afghanistan, I, I posit as a necessary war, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, an unnecessary war, even if Saddam did have weapons of mass destruction. I believe that he did at the time and still thought the invasion was unnecessary and likely to be a disaster, um, influenced by people like Con Crane. Uh, Afghanistan, on the other hand, an entirely necessary war uh, when, when the Taliban refused to hand over Osama bin Laden. Uh, and uh, Al-Qaeda Central, we, we had no choice, I don't think, as a nation, uh, but to go in, topple the Taliban, and attempt to retrieve bin Laden and bring him to justice. We underestimated uh, the, the resources required for that. We certainly underestimated the amount of time required for that. Far too early in that war, turned our attention away from Afghanistan to fight a, another war, an unnecessary uh, second war in Iraq, with predictable consequences for Afghanistan, the, the Afghan effort, uh, uh, under-resourced until President Obama's uh, uh, tenure. Over the course of his first year in office, he, he um, made two decisions to surge troops into Afghanistan. Unfortunately, in my eyes, announcing coincident with the second surge of troops into Afghanistan, the withdrawal date of those troops, undercutting his own policy off at the knees in theater uh, before it ever had the chance to stand up. The, 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 um, People we were fighting against, both in Afghanistan and Pakistan, didn't hear the 30,000 additional troops. They heard the 18-month time limit. And, and uh, so uh, Afghanistan, uh, a place where, where I would argue counterinsurgency worked when it was tried, uh, not um, the counterinsurgency was never really put into practice uh, effectively long enough, hard enough. So if, if there is a silver lining to, um, to, to what's happening in Iraq right now, to the rise of ISIS, in Syria and Iraq. It is a, a clear clarion call for the uh, administration to reverse its current Afghanistan policy, which has all American troops pulling out of Afghanistan by the end of 2016. If that happens, I am confident that uh, the, the next president of the United States will have, uh, will have to go back into Afghanistan, just as this president has had to go back into Iraq. And, and, and so if, if any good can come from um, the discussions I'm privileged to be having with, with people like this audience. Uh, my hope is that we will, we will increase pressure to change current uh, administration policy in Afghanistan and put more resources into the current war 
against ISIS, and I'll end here. Um, uh, I believe that the President has the right ends uh, in mind for his strategy, uh, defeating and ultimately destroying the Islamic State. Uh, I believe that the President has the right ways identified, that is, uh, having local forces, mostly the Kurds and uh, Iraqi forces, uh, conduct the on-the-ground fighting, enabled by American advisors, American air power, American intelligence and logistics. The problem I have with the current policy is the, the means the President is allocating uh, in, in support of those ways to achieve those ends. Uh, we, we're, we're off by a factor of about 10. Uh, rather than 1,500 advisors, we need 15,000 advisors. Uh, we need them uh, embedded inside Iraqi and Kurdish battalions and brigades. We need to, once we have those advisors in those units, our air power will be far more effective uh, and, and uh, the Iraqi units, Kurdish units, will be far more effective. And I can see a fairly rapid demise to ISIS inside Iraq. I cannot see for the life of me what the end state is in Syria. Uh, we chose not to arm, uh, train and equip the moderate Syrian rebels in the summer of 12. That window is closed. Most of those guys are gone, uh, dead or departed, uh, the, the, the environs. And, and so I don't know what end state the U.S. currently foresees for uh, Syria, for the Islamic State in Syria. And I believe that that is a decision that will be left to the next presidential administration. I yield. Thank you very much for that brilliant presentation. Uh, Daniel. Sure. Uh, there are sort of two themes I want to talk a little bit about in John's book, which I thought were very interesting and perhaps can help a lot of how we think about these future conflicts. The first is one of the big takeaways from John's dissertation, and obviously his first book, and the theme throughout the book is how do we help the Army in particular, but also institutions generally become learning institutions so they readily adapt to challenges they weren't initially designed and resourced to uh, address. Um, and part of that, sort of the flip side of that, of course, is how do they become unlearning institutions? How do they become sort of um, mired in a certain way of thinking of the world, a certain sort of resource um, balance that you know, ill-equips them to deal with challenges they're not designed uh, to address? And then the second sort of theme is sort of the civ mill relationship. Um, obviously, uh, John had a chance to witness the Bush administration, the Obama administration very closely, and he saw how the civ mill teams worked or didn't work in many cases. And then, of course, he, at the, the implementing end, he was in the Gulf War and had the benefit of a civ mill relationship that seemed to work generally well. And the thing I'd like to talk about there is how is it that we can help our formal institutions work better? Because a lot of the um, adaptations to these conflicts have typically come from people who are outliers to our bureaucracies, people who are on the margins. And this is true not just in the military, but also in the State Department, USAID, even in the intelligence community. So for example, um, one of the challenges, just to go back to the Army, I think one of the challenges the Army had um, after the Vietnam War, which John talks about readily in his book, is how did it unlearn the lessons of Vietnam? Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, what were the lessons of Vietnam? Uh, I think there are five or six sort of things we can focus on or point to that may have contributed to some of that. Because it was that unlearning of the lessons, if you will, that contributed a lot of our difficulties about initially conceptualizing the problems of Iraq and Afghanistan and then organizing ourselves appropriately to deal with it. Um, the, the first one I just want to focus on is, frankly, the, the untimely early death of General Creighton Abrams in 1974. You know, he was the general who had essentially helped turn around the Vietnam War in many respects. He fought not just the insurgency with a whole of government approach, they also fought the main force units of North Vietnam in a comprehensive uh, manner. So when he passed away uh, in 1974, when he was Chief of Staff of the Army, he really wasn't able to sort of put his vision on the Army, sort of help elevate those general, uh, general officers and others he had known to positions of leadership where they could help influence the uh, future development of the Army as an institution. Along those same lines, he didn't have a chance, of course, to write his own memoirs. If he, if he would have written them anyway. He was a different sort of personality. He may not have written them. And that's important because how we remember wars often influences how we fight future conflicts. Because not many people read very dry after action reports. I mean, they're a labor to, to write, and they often are the last thing that are, stands between you and your family when you come home from a deployment. So um, often we refer to memoirs, we look to histories. Uh, another contributing factor I would point to is the separate sort of institutional development of the U.S. Army Special Forces community. Um, that kind of specialization was absolutely necessary for a long time. I think over time, though, it, by developing separately, it robbed the main sort of U.S. Army as an institution from the benefit of the kind of personalities and others and way of conceptualizing combat uh, that the Special Forces community in particular uh, has. It's a contrarian view often, and I think the Army uh, was uh, less well served by that separate institutional development. Um, a third factor is, I think, frankly, the switch to an all-volunteer force. 
um, obviously took place right after or during the end of Vietnam conflict. I think what that did is it robbed the Army as an institution of sort of a, a broad um, swath of America that would never perhaps normally join the military or the or U.S. Army. And if you, by getting these sort of unconventional people or people with just a different view of things in the Army, it sort of it prevented the institution from constantly sort of adjusting. You started to get a kind of closed society of people who sort of, you start to see sons and daughters of people in the Army start to serve again and again. You know, it starts to become a closed community. I think you know, I, my perspective on that is I'm a reservist, so I, I've, I've mobilized three times. So I've been on the active duty side a little bit. I've seen that, that I've stepped out. And there's benefits to an institution, regardless if it's the Army, of having that kind of unconventional um, career path. Um, another sort of factor I point to, um, this gets really sort of dry, is the 1958 Defense Department Reorganization Act. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's as exciting to say it is, you know, <laughs> as it is to live it. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's, a, it's an act that's, that's often wrapped in the language of this solidified civilian control of the military. Gosh, you know, President Eisenhower signed it. He was the major uh, advocate for it. Uh, and so it's sort of also forgotten at the tail end of the Eisenhower administration. And this act did a couple things. One is it took the chiefs of staffs as an institution, as a corporate body, out of the chain of command. So the fielded force, the uniform military downrange, no longer has a unified sort of military chain of command back to <clears throat> the headshed, if you will, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, along those same lines, it also got rid of the chiefs of staff, uh, not just a corporate body, but the Army Chief of Staff, the other chiefs of staffs from the chain of command. The book I think of when I talk about that is Mark Perry's good book called uh, Partners in Command, which talks about the Marshall-Eisenhower relationship during the war. And you see very quickly from that book, when you've got the guy fighting the war, is able to call, so to speak, the chief of staff and get direction and provide on the ground truth. And then that chief of staff is able to take that to the White House. The president has confidence he's getting the ground truth and it's all connected. That unified, I think, chain of command is actually very beneficial. But then you have that Army Chief of Staff nested within the Joint Chiefs. And so that corporate body, for all its you know, occasional dysfunction, is a useful institutional process for a war plan to be looked at, to be chewed on. Because each service has a different perspective on war. And each service has uh, its own kind of roles and missions it struggles over. It wants to play in the war, if you will, participate. And I think that kind of process enriches a ca uh, campaign plan. So in a way, so what I would say is hey, take Tommy Frank's first cut at Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you very much. It's an excellent first draft. <laughs> it, the Joint Chiefs of Staff now is an institution. Uh, actually, the Chief of Staff of the Army will now take it, Shinseki. He'll then take it to the Joint Chiefs. They'll chew on it and talk about it. And then they'll present it to Secretary Rumsfeld and President Bush. I think that's a useful process. There were some downsides to it. That's there's the reason why Eisenhower put these reforms in. But I think that's a useful, useful um, uh, institutional change. Um, and I also think, too, when you have the Joint Chiefs as part of the chain of command, what that does, it does a couple things. It protects the civilian leadership from sort of bad decisions and provides military top cover for civilian leaders. At the same time, it protects the institution of the military from uh, unconventional civilian ideas about how to wage war that may not actually work. You know, essentially allows the professionals to be in the right position and allows them to protect the administration when they have to change direction in a war. Uh, I think, for example, of uh, General Ridgway during the Eisenhower administration. You know, President Eisenhower asked him to go to Vietnam. What can we do to help the French to you know, prevent their defeat in, in Vietnam? Well, he came back and said, Mr. President, we're going to need several hundred thousands of troops. It's not doable. That's a great thing if you're a politician, if you're President Eisenhower. You're saying, I've had my chief of staff, who is a an expert and a professional, evaluate the terms of the, the, the battle, the, the war. And so he's, he said, we can't do it. I, I defer to his greater expertise. It gives political top cover to an administration. Now, because it goes president, secretary of defense, the guy waging the war through the combatant commander, the Secretary of Defense being a political person is sort of hidebound to the initial strategy. They're, they're connected to it. To change direction is to admit um, a, a mistake, to admit fault, and that has political consequences. So as you have the Chiefs of Staff as a, service, as a, a, joint, uh, as a corporate body, they can provide that kind of top cover. So that's just, these are some institutional things. By the way, my background is a political scientist, so this is very like institutional stuff. But I think a lot of the challenges we've had is just getting our institutions to work properly and so we've often found these cut arounds through unconventional individuals who don't have typical kind of career paths in their institutions, making it work. You know? And that's great. We've all, we've all deployed Iraq and Afghanistan, and we know it's often about personality. That's because institutions aren't well designed to do what's required. So we constantly do workarounds. And that's also true at the strategic level as well.
Thank you. John, any thoughts on? Uh, let me pick up on Dan's uh, excellent last point. W one of the really interesting things about the war, uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, has been, as Dan suggests, that, that so much uh, of the thinking and the policy changes originated in people who had no official position whatsoever or who vastly over, uh, overreached their own institutional position. So, so for instance, uh, David Petraeus, as, as a, a relatively junior three-star general uh, commanding the Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, was, was re rewriting Iraq war strategy over the course of 2006. Rin hints of this uh, rose to, to Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. He sent a snowflake asking about this, saying if strategy in Iraq was, was being rewritten, uh, perhaps someone ought to talk to him. Right? And, and he received a response, oh, Petraeus is just updating dusty old army manuals. Don't worry about it. Right, and, and right, that, that was somewhat true. Hmm. Uh, but, but, but Petraeus, um, uh, from a, a seat where he was expected to have uh, no influence on policy and be able to do no damage, in fact, was, was overturning uh, decades of, of army thinking and, and current thinking on a, a war then happening. Uh, the role of Jack Keane, a retired vice chief of staff of the army, who Tom Rick says uh, in uh, Fiasco, became the, uh, or maybe Tom's second book, uh, uh, after Fiasco, The Gamble. The Gamble. Uh, uh, Rick says that, that Jack Keane became the de facto chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, promulgating a new strategy for Iraq, uh, uh, proposing uh, hiring and firing secretaries of defense and uh, theater commanders, d despite the fact that as a retired four-star, he had no official standing whatsoever. And arguably, he became the most important military officer uh, in the United States as a, as a civilian retired four-star. So the, the, um, Dan's, Dan's exactly right. The, the um, innovative people saw a problem and found ways to, to subvert the, the, the system and, and um, come up with a, a, a different way to think about the problem and, and ultimately to, to attempt to solve the problem. Fred Kaplan tells this story well in his book, The Insurgents. Um, it shouldn't have to be that way. The system the, the, the system should not fail as badly as it did, either in leaving uh, the Army, the Marine Corps, as poorly prepared to conduct an insurgency uh, as they were in 2002, 2003, um, not having a phase four plan uh, for what happened after the fall of, of uh, Baghdad in 2003. I'll give them a pass on, on, on what happened, not having a plan for what happened after the, Baghdad, after the government in Kabul fell in 2001, but 2003 was a war of our choosing. Uh, we should have had a plan for phase four. Uh, and, and then uh, the system should have been able to uh, read what was going on and innovate and change and adapt uh, more rapidly and without all the workarounds that were required to do it. And so as, as people write future doctoral dissertations on, on this series of events, um, uh, my hope is that they will, they will think through both the role of personalities and the role of, of institutions in, in creating a more flexible, adaptive learning organization. Question for both of you, which is, you know, it strikes me that you know, the, uh, everything that you've just said and everything you've written and thought about and lived you know, <coughs> suggests that fighting insurgencies is a prolonged exercise. Um, and yet, you know, the United States, is it, part of its self-conception is that it's not an empire, to, and you can debate whether it is or it isn't. But isn't there something sort of embedded in the sort of American kind of way of thinking about the world that actually prevents the kind of long-term investments? I mean, you know, there was, uh, that there would be necessary to get it right. I mean, it seems to me, I completely agree with you. I don't think Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush or whoever is gonna say, yeah, that's a really great idea. Let's pull every troop, combat troop out or any form of, uh, you know, on December 31st, 2016. So, so the point is, is Afghanistan, you know, by any reasonable measure, is going to be a, a long-term enterprise. And we keep, as you point out, John, you know, on December 1st, uh, 2009, when President Obama went to West Point, he put the 18-month, and everybody, that, that was the crawl on CNN before he even gave the speech. It was, where <laughs> was, the, was about the drawdown, not about the, uh, the, the new troops. So, so the point is, is there something about in the American kind of way of thinking about the world that actually kind of is, actually sabotages the idea of uh, these kind of counterinsurgency. And what, what, what is the answer to the why the, the army, for instance, put Vietnam in the rear view mirror, uh, other than the fact that it was an unpleasant experience? And was there something deeper <coughs> here? I sort of think like, you know, our, our whole government is designed to do conventional warfare, conventional diplomacy, conventional intelligence gathering, conventional development work. You know, that, that 
worldview tends to focus on activities in the capital with national level partners, formal institutions. We tend to be very force protection conscious. We tend to have a short term perspective on long term problems. And we rarely get to wisdom because our rotations are so frequent across the government uh, that we're all constantly playing catch up and only get to situational awareness. And so we often fight wars that are convenient, convenient to our bureaucratic design mm -hmm. and structures than, than they are on their own terms. You know, the, there's this famous RAND study, which I'm sure John knows about, and Peter, uh, Bureaucracy Does Its Thing by Robert Comer, who was a famous sort of uh, Lyndon Johnson administration, later Carter administration policy official, who helped uh, put together the CORDS program in Vietnam, which was this unique creature of a unified civil mill organization that sought to fight the Viet Cong insurgency holistically, uh, governance, developments, enduring local security, et cetera. And he, he wondered why did it take so long for the government writ large to adapt to this challenge that they weren't designed to originally sort of work through. Uh, and that was a fascinating uh, study to read. There aren't many you can say that, it, you know, ran or fascinating <laughs> and gripping. But this one was, because it helped me organize my own set of experiences to understand why were certain people readily adapting to these problems? You know, why were others struggling with it? And I think that's one of the challenges. We don't really have a domestic political constituency to do counterinsurgency work. We have a hell of a great constituency for fighting conventional wars. You know, uh, mm -hmm. there are defense contractors, there are, you know, bases all over the country. But the, the, the parts of our bureaucracy most well positioned to deal with these problems are those that are least well funded and most politically um, weak. So for example, just to pick one office, I hope this doesn't cause it to be obliterated, mm -hmm. but US, USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives. You know, they, they lovingly say they're the special forces of USAID. You know, they're a redheaded stepchild of that institution. You know, within the uh, U.S. military, particularly the Army, you know, the U.S. Special Forces is certainly well-resourced today, but in many ways it's still a bureaucratic um, side player. It's not essential. That's not often that people go to first when we, we deal with these wars. Um, within the State Department, you have uh, State Department officers who are, you know, who love hardship tours. They self-select. You know, they, they, they've made peace with the fact they'll never be, never be ambassador. They'll never be a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. And they're really happy with that, actually. You know, and they are constantly drawn to war zones. And they're, they're good, but you only have a certain number of those people. You burn through them fairly quickly. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of how we're designed is we're just not designed to do this. And I think the reason we keep, I think we're sort of um, of mixed views on how we do these things. I think being a revolutionary power, we like to think you know, we have ideas for how the world should be organized. And we do as a country, and that's a great thing about our country. But that often leads us to go overseas, but then our bureaucracies aren't well designed to bring that vision to fruition. Yeah, and then we're sort of playing catch up. There's sort of a learning curve of intervention we go through. Our yeah. initial plan doesn't work. There's eventually a process where it runs into uh, difficulties. Uh, people are fired, elections occur, and then all of a sudden there's a new leadership that pops up of people who've learned from the ground, such as General Petraeus at a lower level, <coughs> Creighton Abrams at a lower level, and then we finally get it right, but by that point, we're on the way out. Well, John, what's your assessment now of the extent to which the uh, lessons learned are being internalized or, or forgotten? So uh, the best single quote I've heard on uh, explaining what uh, Dan just said is a possibly apocryphal uh, unnamed Army Lieutenant Colonel during the Vietnam War who said, I'll be damned if I allow the traditions, the history, the customs of the United States Army to be turned upside down just to win this goddamn war. <laughs> so so we get, you got to have priorities, right? Um, and and w whether it's it's true or not, it's exactly on point. It's how the organization yeah. feels, the the or, or how the organization has felt. Mm. So in the um, in the wake of Desert Storm, uh, the U.S. Army, broadly speaking, focused the the next decade on figuring out how to do Desert Storm even better, while the rest of the world figured out how not to let Desert Storm happen to it. Since then, then we've had another decade, almost 15 years now of war where the rest of the world has seen what happens to the United States if you try to take them on in conventional combat and what happens if you use a protracted warfare strategy. The, the rest of the world knows what they're going to do. The future of conflict is not going to be tank on tank, fighter plane on fighter plane. We need to continue to maintain the capability to fight those kind of wars. We need to have a force in being that, that by its very existence prevents those wars from happening. But the wars we're actually going to be fighting are the grind, grinding, messy, slow, uh, uh, savage wars of peace, uh, Rudyard Kipling quote. And, and the, the Army is struggling to come to terms, the US military is struggling to come to terms with that realization. Uh, a very important step in the bureaucratic learning process uh, came uh, while I was still in the Pentagon, I think it must have been in 2005, uh, 2005 or 2006, 
And Deputy Secretary of Defense Gordon England signed DOD Directive 3000.05, which, which said that after 230 years of the U.S. military being responsible for doing two things, attacking and defending, adding a whole third mission set, that the U.S. military is also responsible for stability operations in occupied uh, territory. The, the truth is that we'd been doing more of that than we'd been doing attacking or defending over the course of the nation's history, but it had never been enshrined as a priority in doctrine. And so the, the fact is that um, right, 70 years after the end of World War II, 60 years, uh, we, we, 70 years after the end of World War II, we still have American troops garrisoning Germany, Italy, and Japan. Right, 60 years after the end of the Korean War, we still have American troops in South Korea. Uh, 20 years after the war in, in, in the, the Balkans, we still have American troops there. And, and so, the, particularly in an era of an all-volunteer force, which Dan talked about, the President and the U.S. foreign policy establishment has enormous leeway in what it does with, with its troops, with its all-volunteer troops. And, and those troops have been, I would argue, part of the, the, the security guarantee that has allowed the extraordinarily peaceful, extraordinarily economically productive years since the Second World War. And, and we have to um, inform, educate our administrations about the, the role that those troops play and the mm. absolute necessity, uh, now having seen what happens when we don't leave those damping rods in the nuclear reactor uh, by, by pulling all the American troops out of Iraq, that we don't do the same damn thing in Afghanistan in 2016. Well, you both, uh, you served in Uruz Gan, uh, and you actually wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you spend any time in Afghanistan, John? Only visits, war okay. tourism, Okay, like a journalist. So, I mean, what's your prognosis? I mean, you know, we, we have had uh, a national unity government uh, between you know, you know, a group of people who don't really like each other, but it seems to be sticking. Uh, we have ha signed a BSA, um, a, a basing agreement, the day after, as promised, uh, in the, as part of the campaign uh, promises that the, uh, both candidates made. Um, you know, what's your prognosis for how things might uh, turn out, Dan? Uh, I just hope we're there for in a light, lean, long-term presence that's yeah. fiscally sustainable. Uh, I had a chance to visit a province, uh, serve in a province twice in 2005, 06, and in 2012, a province called the Ruzgan. The thing I was most struck by being away from it for six years was how much uh, Afghan institutions had developed and how they were more resilient. When I was first there, you'd have the illiterate warlord and you have the semi-literate administrative guy as his deputy, mm. and then you'd have essentially a, a laundered uh, militia that had become a formal security institution. When I went back in 2012, it's the little things that tell you stability has arrived. Uh, the fact they wear uniforms, the fact that they're proactive, the fact that um, they're more mired in their own bureaucracy now, which didn't exist before because they were predom mm. predominantly illiterate. Um, those kind of things I was really struck by. And the fact you had the Army, the Afghan National Police, and the Afghan local police generally working well together. There was useful friction there because each had strengths and weaknesses and they sort of helped each other out. Uh, I was really struck by that. I think if we can just maintain a, a, a somewhat constant level of funding, allow uh, Afghanistan with their minerals, et cetera, to develop more, um, uh, develop a little bit more, I think that would, would put them in a good position. But I think we need to be there to provide that logistical support, intelligence support, um, health, close air support, et cetera but a light lean long term. I was really amazed at how much violence had receded in 2012. The nature, you know, not all violence is created equal, right? So uh, I, the violence in 2012 was largely individual based. Um, assassinations, car bombs, um, and uh, individual level kind of attacks versus 2006, you had 200, 300 man fighting formations mm. seeking to uh, take and hold territory. It was a very different war by 2012, but I think we need to be there for the long term in a light, light long-term and lean presence. John? Completely agree. Yeah. You both uh, fought in Anbar, and, uh, which is now basically con controlled by ISIS. Um, I mean, if, if we'd had this conversation three years ago, would you have been surprised by that? And how did, you know, how, what do you feel about the whole? So the, the first paper I wrote after I became president of the CNAS in 2009 was called After the Fire, and it argued for a long-term security presence in Iraq. Argued made very much the same argument uh, that Dan has just made about Afghanistan. Uh, that, that Iraq has made enormous progress, has, has um, essentially uh, defeated al-Qaeda in Iraq, flipped the Sunnis, defeated the, both insurgencies that we were facing when I was fighting there in 2004. Dan saw it, that fight a little bit later and, and argued that with a, a long-term investment of 20, 25,000 uh, American advisors, uh, some American air power, uh, logistics, some medical support, 
that, that uh, at very low risk to the American troops, we could maintain uh, a, sta a stable situation in Iraq, prevent the, the reemergence of Al Qaeda in Iraq, and, and create um, stability, uh, a degree of stability in the heart of the Middle East. Uh, we, we chose a different option with entirely predictable Well, can I, can I just drill down on that a little bit? Because uh, you keep saying the phrase pulling out and uh, you know, the Obama administration, clearly there was, there was uh, it, uh, the Obama administration may have made mistakes here, but there was uh, pretty clear signals from the, from the Iraqis about what they didn't want. So th there's, a, there's a really good piece in the current foreign affairs, which is an insurgency, counterinsurgency foreign affairs, led by a, a debate between Max Boot and Dick Betts. I commend uh, this, this foreign affairs to you. The next piece after the debate between the two of them is an analysis of just those negotiations. Yeah. And, and uh, the author, whose name I've, I've, I've lost, I apologize, uh, ar argues uh, pretty compellingly in my eyes uh, that I think there are people in the room who are part of these negotiations. I look forward to hearing from them. Mm. Uh, but but um, my understanding of the negotiations is that Maliki was willing to sign an executive order, president to president, uh, guaranteeing uh, the American troops in Iraq the same protections that they'd had during a previous executive agreement from 2008 to 2011, mm. uh, and, and that uh, President Obama was unwilling to accept an executive agreement, uh, right, president to president. He demanded that, that it be approved by the parliament. This Maliki was not willing to do for the relatively low uh, num troop levels that President Obama was willing to provide. 3,000 to 5,000 are the numbers. Uh, I hear uh, bandied about, and and, and right, right, it, it's worth it's worth as you contemplate asking the Iraqi Parliament to provide long-term uh, legal protections to an American force occupying the country in 2011, right after what Iraq had just been through. It's worth contemplating how easy it is for the United States President to get a treaty through the Senate, right, and 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 then understand what it was we're asking. We were uh, asking the Iraqi government, the nascent Iraqi government, to do in 2011. Uh, finally, I will point out that the American troops currently serving on the ground in Iraq do not have a status of forces agreement. They don't even have a president to president guarantee of legal protections. The legal protections they are currently operating under are in a piece of paper signed by the Iraqi foreign minister. And, and so you, you can't have it both ways. Yeah. Either our troops should not be there now under that degree of legal protection, or we had the legal ability to accept a higher degree of protection than the troops they're currently serving have, uh, and, and those troops could have prevented this from happening. So it open to questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and identify yourself. So we'll start with this gentleman here. And <laughs> my microphone is right behind you, sir. Yes, hi, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Kevin Wensing, retired Navy captain. I wanted to ask a question about uh, sort of restoring American trust. When you're drawing red lines in, in the sand and you know, uh, doing things like that, how, how can America restore trust around the world? And I think uh, you, you talked a little bit about uh, the post-Vietnam era, the military-industrial complex, you know, the sort of lobby against a counterinsurgency. Not a lot of money to be made in that. So those are the two questions about restoring American trust and the military-industrial complex. You want me to take? I'll, I'll take the first. You take the military-industrial. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I mentioned how difficult uh, Syria is and how I'm unable to see the end state in Syria. Uh, part of the problem for that is that I think the president boxed, him in, boxed himself in unnecessarily by drawing a red line in the sand uh, against, uh, uh, against Assad uh, and then obviously not following through on it. The, the real problem there, I think, is not just the, the loss of American credibility occasioned as a result of that decision, but it makes turning to Assad as a long-term security answer in Syria very, very difficult. And the fact is that Assad is not a particularly nice guy, right? but he's better than ISIS. And, and those are the only two options I see, given that we didn't arm train and equip the moderate Syrian uh, rebels in, in the summer of 12, and those guys are now gone. The, the only long-term options I see for ruling Syria are ISIS and Assad. Right? And, and the, the, the famous uh, Winston Churchill quotation, right? if Hitler invaded hell, I would make at least a favorable reference to the devil in mm -hmm. the House of Commons. Uh, Assad is, is, is better than ISIS. Faint praise, but maybe our best answer. That red line is going to make it very, very difficult for this administration to deal with him as a long-term security answer in Syria. It's my belief that, that the administration is going to let the next administration figure out what, who is going to govern Syria. Right? Uh, St. Augustine, the only purpose of a war is to build a better peace. 
a better peace in Syria may be Assad. Yeah. No, I think you're right. You know, I think, I don't want to say it's just the military industrial complex. There are a lot of contributing factors to it. You know, how, how for example, we remember conflicts. You know, most uh, military memoirs are typically written by junior officers that are going to combat for the first time. Um, they're usually from combat arms. Um, they don't frequently have a long-term perspective on an area. It's often a, a coming-of-age sort of uh, character to it. Um, you know, conventional wars tend to get written about more frequently than uh, unconventional conflicts, which reinforces the conventional war narrative. Um, and I'm sort of channeling uh, the Great War in Modern Memory by Paul Fussell. You know, mm. how we remember a conflict absolutely influences how we you know fight the next one. And I apply that also to movies. You know, for example, everyone sort of thinks Zero Dark Thirty and the future you know Chris Kyle uh, movie that's coming out that that's that's the Iraq War or that's that's going after Al Qaeda when it's a, a holistic approach. You know, it's sitting with Shuras. That's not particularly compelling, you know, video feed. <laughs> you know, it doesn't blow up, for example. You know, um, you know, often victory is a uh, whimper, not a thunderclap. There isn't frequently a decisive battle. Maybe there is occasional Dien Bien Phu type of situation, but frequently security uh, in an insurgency environment, when you get it right, it reaches this little tipping point, and it's not particularly compelling. Mm -hmm. You know, there are dozens of books on the battles of Fallujah, and in many cases, appropriately so, f for sure. But how Fallujah was eventually won really wasn't covered that much. It wasn't that particularly compelling visually or from a, a journalistic perspective. It kind of got the obligatory uh, one or two articles to commemorate it. But other than that, it's not well known. Um, mm -hmm. And so you know, how we measure success, we tend to mismeasure success in these kinds of conflicts. You know, so. Cool. It was start with this guy, and then we'll do you. Thanks. All right. Uh, <clears throat> two questions. One, my name is Stuart Sloan, a civilian. Um, you hear the president and, uh, and his supporters constantly use the phrase war-weary America as an excuse for the kinds of decisions he made. I'd like to have your comment on that, given we have a volunteer army with uh, so few actually in combat. The second question, Dan, has to do with you, Dan. Uh, you made the point, uh, you, uh, the decried the uh, turnover, uh, constant turnover. But you extended the, your comment not only to military but to civilian. But later that you said, well, we have elections and situations change. Uh, as a, I can only speak from personal experience, as a former political appointee, I think it's wonderful that you get turnover in the government because new people get to look, they don't have a vested interest in all policies, they can look at it fresh, and come up with new ideas. It would be horrible, I think, to have a permanent civil service. Uh, uh, and that's, those are my two questions. To me, it's a, it's a balance of factors, right? Right now, we have constant rotations. So for example, in Yemen, the last nine US ambassadors have each served three-year terms. That has everything to do with career, manage, career management versus having a tailored approach to Yemen. So our bureaucracies deal with every country relatively equally. You know, uh, you know, if you have a for more formal institutions like France, yeah, maybe a three years makes sense. But in a country such as Yemen, maybe you want your ambassador to stay there a little longer. You know, in Afghanistan, we had the Afghan and Afghan Pakistan hands program. I mean, the amount of effort it took to get this fairly modest program established, the amount of energy it took to just get these bureaucratic uh, career paths and just bend just slightly to create that, was, I mean, that took a whole war to do that, <laughs> you know, and, and versus these like steady state, like, who knows Chad really well in this town? Well, you know, there might be two or three folks, maybe they're more, I apologize to those who love Chad, <laughs> but like, how do we find them and incentivize them to develop some expertise? Uh, you, know, you can have creative dissonance in, a, in an embassy. Yeah, maybe you still have the ambassador serve three years, and that's fine, but maybe his or her sort of staff below the level are there for five years or 10 years. You know, you're not gonna get a memoir like 41 years in India which is a famous memoir, you know, from that, you know, what, who the hell, what was it, who was this detailer, you know? <laughs> you know, you, you don't, you always constantly, you never get the wisdom about a place. You, and so because of that, you're, you're sort of more open to, open to sort of surface level interpretations of things. So I, I agree with you, you're gonna have to have some change, of course, and that's probably healthy. Sometimes you wanna get rid of people to improve the situation. But you do, you do wanna have that, that, that steady state of expertise, and, and by extension, like think tanks. You know, you'll throw a rock in this town, you'll find plenty of China experts. There are a ton of Russia experts. All the big countries and strategic countries are well, well um, covered. But, you know, heaven forbid you find a, a person who knows Yemen or Somalia or Chad or these kind of edges of empire that, you know, no one really makes a large career on. But those are the people you want when a threat comes out of it. 
Uh, let me talk to the war weariness. Uh, it allows me to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is this generation of young soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, uh, many of them who signed up after September 11th knowing they would be sent to war, uh, who've done three, four, five combat tours and, and who um, are now being demobilized, in some cases involuntarily, some of them are army officers, army soldiers, being given separation notices from the army while they're serving on combat duty in Afghanistan, right, e even as we speak. So the, the nation is not war weary, but those young men and women are war weary, and in particular, our special forces are war weary. They are exhausted, and the demand for them is going up, not down. And so one of, one of my uh, hobby horses uh, I've been advocating for a number of years. My last job in the Army was training advisor teams for Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we were uh, the wrong people to do it. We were tank drivers. It should have been Special Forces training them. Uh, they were going to mountains and deserts, so of course we trained them on the plains of Kansas. Uh, and, and rather than taking the, the best and most talented veterans, uh, combat veterans, we were choosing people who had not yet been to combat, were not selected for any, attitude, uh, for any particular attributes that would make them good advisors, in particular empathy. So, so uh, I, I uh, argued way back in 2007, the first paper I think CNAS ever published, that it was time for the Army to, to build uh, a long-term advisor presence, part of the, the organizational adaptation to the demands of these wars. Uh, it was fairly uniquely an idea endorsed by both Senator Obama and Senator McCain during the 2008 presidential election. It is something that still hasn't happened. And, and there was an earlier question about the adaptation of, of uh, the U.S. military to these wars. When, when the U.S. builds the long-term advisory presence that it's going to need for these conflicts for a generation, then we'll know that we, we really get it. Did you have a question, sir? Uh, I'm Dave Mattingly. I'm a OIF veteran. I uh, in the J2 at uh, Baghdad for about three years, and then out at uh, Abu Ghraib, uh, 2005. You answered part of the question that I had as far as the advisory corps, and I think remarkably, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines that were involved with the Awakening Movement and the Sons of Iraq did just that, but. They did it just because they were thrown into the mix. They showed up one day and said, guess what, you're the new sons of a rock officer. But today, those sons of a rock aren't there anymore because we walked away from them. And I'm sure you've seen the quote about the officer who met one of the former leaders of it and he threw the command coins on the ground and said, what are these worth now? And if we're going to build that advisory Corps and the long-term advisory process, we have to be able to commit to people that are going to work with us that we're going to be there. And I would say that that is part of the, the issue right now. Not so much the, the governments, but the people have to be able to uh, trust us to be there for the long term. And your else comments. That, that's exactly right. So one of the reasons why the Islamic State cut through Al Anbar like a hot knife through butter over the course of this year is because the, the Sunnis of Al Anbar in many cases thought that ISIS would be better uh, for them, would take better care of them than the, the uh, Iraqi government of Prime Minister Al Maliki, who uh, the day after the American troops left in, in December of 2011, the next day he fired and arrested his Sunni vice president and, mm -hmm. and has, has exhibited a, a pattern of behavior of, of uh, oppressing uh, his, his Sunni population, and, and now the Sunni population of Iraq, and in particular of Al-Anbar, is on the fence waiting to see if the new government of uh, al-Abadi is in fact going to be a government for all Iraqis. The, the, the um, support of the Sunni population of Anbar is essential to the continued survival of ISIS uh, inside Iraq, and, and, and we gave up the leverage that we, we had had with people like um, you know, conflict junkie ambassador, American hero Ryan Crocker, um, Dave Petraeus, who, who were able to leverage American military power to accomplish American political objectives of uh, uh, Shia inclusiveness of Sunnis inside the Iraqi government. We, we, we've got a, another lever now with, with the barbarians at the gates of Baghdad. It's going to be interesting to see if we can use that to, to pry decent behavior from this, this beleaguered government uh, of Iraq and then keep American 
boots on the ground there for the long term to continue to, to shway, shway, slowly, slowly steer the Iraqi government toward, toward inclusive. Who's in charge of Iraq policy right now? I think it's Vice President Joe Biden. Um, there are many who are involved, but few don't seem to be responsible. You know, it's sort of, you know, Brett McGurk is certainly a key uh, player in this for sure. General Allen, I think, has a lot of influence across the board. Um, so I, I, I'm not exactly sure. Did you have a question, sir? Uh, Chris Coglanis um, with the U.S. Pacific Command. John, you and I hashed this out a little bit uh, on the advisory corps thing. One of the, one of the issues is we're downsizing the army now. The problem is, and I've served for those I've served as an advisor in Iraq. I was the last American soldier to serve in Samara. I've also served as commander and advisor team in Afghanistan. So I've got a little bit of experience uh, at the cutting edge of this. As we're downsizing the army. We're cutting a lot of the heavy, the higher ranks naturally because they're expensive. Colonels are expensive, mass sergeants, sergeant majors are expensive. But that's where the rank has to go. So there's going to be a bureaucratic conundrum of you're going to have all these extra colonels, lieutenant colonels, mass sergeants, sergeant majors just as in the army to do this stuff. Um, how are we going to resolve this? The uh, second point I'd make is regarding, without getting into the politics of it, uh, as the last guy in Samara, I had a conversation with Lieutenant General Rashid, who now has the distinction of being the senior Iraqi ground force commander in Anbar province fighting ISIS about our withdrawal. As I was leaving, this was in September of 2011, and he told me, he says that, uh, my, my, my kunya was Abu Yusuf, he said, I've talked to Prime Minister Maliki, he wants you to stay. He wants the Americans to stay, but he can't get it through Parliament and he knows he needs to get it through Parliament, and that's why you all must go. And I'll throw that back to the uh, advisor question specifically. Uh, let me take, let me take the advisor sure. uh, question if I can. Uh, so the, the Army, I think, has really struggled um, with the drawdown from Iraq and Afghanistan to, to provide a compelling narrative to Congress and to the nation on what it's for. Right? Uh, it also has the extraordinary gift of the most combat experience force the nation has ever had going back to Valley Forge, right? And, and the, the combat experience of our, our mid-grade officers and non-commissioned officers is literally invaluable and irreplaceable. And so as the Army draws down, and I believe it has, it, the, the nation certainly wants it to draw down, I would preserve, one, one, of the, one of the buzzwords being used is expansibility, right? So you, you draw the Army down and you, you want a flexible Army that can get big again if we need it, to, to, to give that expansibility, what you need is staff sergeants, sergeants first class, and majors. You can turn a major into a colonel in two years. You can turn a staff sergeant into a first sergeant in two years in conflict, right? But it takes 10 years to build a staff sergeant or to build a major. And, and so what the Army should have done as it started the drawdown is held on to those mid-grades, put them in advisor units. By the way, there's plenty of places to send those advisors right now. Right? Demand exceeds supply. If you build it, they will come. We didn't build it and they're coming anyway. Right. And, and, and I believe that the Congress would be willing to support that if the Army got behind it and said we need to preserve this combat capability and we need to, the, this combat experience, we need to build this advisor capability given the way the world works, the way the world looks, and uh, we need to, to preserve an expansible Army and this is how you do it. I think that's a compelling narrative and I think it works in the budget battles. Uh, I know Armed Services Committee Chair uh, John McCain would think it was a good idea. Senator Obama endorsed it in his presidential campaign. The Army has not gone, seen fit to go back to both of them and say, hey, let's, uh, we're, we want to do this. We're behind this. You said you were with us. Give us, give us uh, an extra $10 billion a year uh, and an extra 30,000 spaces, and this is how we're going to use them. It hasn't even tried. Gentleman here. And the lady in front of him as well. So. Eddie Becker, uh, filmmaker and observer of this. And uh, I mean, it, it really seems as if, you know, this solution, this military solution will continue to fail. And it has to do with, you know, the inability of the governing structure in Iraq or in Afghanistan to govern. And that has to do with, you know, the strategy of a war of decapitation where you basically remove the top and the government. I mean, so to focus in on that, 
why was it that the Congress of Iraq rejected uh, the United States? Was it because they had to agree with the United States as its ruler in terms of like, you know, this is, we, we'll find the people who agree with us rather than helping to develop the indigenous people to govern themselves, which is a structure that goes back thousands of years and they've seemed to work it out at times. And I mean, I, I just don't think that, you know, within the last 20 years or 50 years, we could, we could sort of like inject ourselves as the top of that and be successful. So, you know, this is a, a war of, uh, I mean, America's wars of either uh, the, the early counterinsurgencies war in the United States was uh, of a, um, um, a the, the war in Malaysia was a colonial war. The wars in the United States uh, were uh, wars of uh, a settler colony uh, destroying the, the Native Americans. And, and, and if you wanted to occupy a place, the only successful war is a war of, uh, uh, of a settler colony, like in Israel which is a, also a, a sort of a settler colony, which isn't that successful in, in basically settling itself in areas that, uh, where the people aren't agreeing with them. So, so the question is, you know, with Vietnam, it wasn't a military strategy. It was that Diem and uh, Ki weren't very good uh, uniters of the people, and they basically had their own self-interest. That's the same problem you're having in Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay. And, okay. So, yes, sir. Yeah, John, uh, you know, it's often when we, when, we in, when we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, we, we often knew the least about the country, but we were also at that moment in time when we had to draft a constitution <laughs> and we were most susceptible to the outside influence of groups that weren't particularly magnanimous. They were more interested in score settling, in, mm -hmm. certainly in the case of Iraq. And then the structural weaknesses of those constitutions were masked through just the great energy of U.S. diplomats and military personnel and development officials who would cajole groups to get together, who would influence here, pressure there, and kind of make the system work for what it was. But then as, after we draw out, once we leave, the, 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 the fault lines in that structure become very you know, evident. You know, so for example, um, you know, we, we often have a, a unitary state but a decentralized society. And then our efforts tend to mask those weaknesses. You know, so I think you know, often your strategy to fight insurgencies, you're organized like the enemy and you his, use his strategy against him. It's similar true, I think, for our governing structures. You wanted to mirror as much as you can society in a way that causes people to focus on reforming poor governing institutions and not reject them and pull out from them, much like the Sunnis did. Yeah, uh, this lady here. Um, and just while we, yeah, I mean, the Afghan constitution was, you know, we're still trying to undo the damage done. Right. Bye. My name's Nehan Sari. I'm a visiting researcher at Carnegie Endowment. Uh, you talked about a light, long-term presence. Are you, were you alluding to the small footprint approach or a more diluted or a concentrated version of that? And if I'm, if I'm correct in presuming that such an approach requires more dependency on par regional and local partners, but most of the time the partners are unreliable. I'm from Pakistan, so I know that. So I'm just asking you. Pakistan is highly reliable. <laughs> Just asking you, how, how do you s what, what do you see the efficacy of such an approach in the long term? Sure. You know, I, I mean, I think we're, we should shift to that approach in part because we've done a fairly decent job of building up Afghan formal institutions. I, as I mentioned earlier, I was really struck by how just not just the sheer size of the Afghan army, the Afghan police, and the Afghan local police, but just their institutional complexity and sort of um, um, structures. I was really struck by that. So I think in a lot of ways this is a, an outgrowth of success. I, I think. I think our bureaucracies want to have a risk-averse, you know, light, lean, long-term presence. I don't think they really want a light, light, light lean, long-term presence, but we need to be decentralized. We need to be out there taking some risk for our soldiers who are partnered with these uh, Afghan um, security institutions across the country. I don't, I hate to, I'd hate to see us just kind of hunker down at a couple, three major bases and do as a commuti commuting capacity building, you know. Uh, I mean, I really think you have to be embedded with the unit. Um, and that will bolster certainly the, the, the morale of that unit and that you know, will also know you can bring additional resources to bear because you're U.S. personnel. But I, th I think in a lot of ways that's, that should be how we do it, but I think in a lot of ways we're just kind of pulling back to large bases and just kind of washing our hands a little bit of everything just and hoping for the best. Yeah. And that's particularly true right now when those units are in combat. You, you can't combat advise 
uh, five miles back from the forward edge of the battle area. We, we've got to assume risk and, and um, in order to succeed, in order to create less risk um, to the long-term threat of ISIS and the, the, the subject that, that Peter is thinking about now, uh, jihad coming home right, to, to these well, places. So how would you assess the, uh, the airstrikes? I mean, clearly uh, there have been a lot of them, and uh, every day you get, you know, CENTCOM press release saying we've killed, you know, we took out this ISIL HQ and five vehicles, and there's kind of, you know, you must be, at this, this must have tripped them over time to some degree, right? And they must change their tactics. They're not operating in the open. But what is the, so what is the long term? If you're of the, if, okay, so if you're Baghdadi's military advisor, and, you're, and what, would, what would you be saying to him right now, A, about what we should be doing, and B, about how this is looking for us in the long term? Well, I think the first thing I would do is uh, consolidate my gains that I have achieved so far <coughs> by getting rid of uh, potential uh, fifth column, you know, elements within my territory. So anyone who's not Sunni Arab is on my list of people I would you know, suppress, eliminate, or push out just to solidify control. I would then, on the on the flip side of that, have a real robust hearts and minds effort to uh, convince those who are now in our, under our control that we are actually are much better for you than any alternative that would be presented to you. Mm -hmm. And you know, ISIS has a pretty impressive, you know, tribal engagement strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, they have very good phase four planning actually. Uh, yeah. Apparently, so you know they're they're allowing civil servants to simply just just do your jobs, you know. And mm. whereas we sort of got rid of a lot of them after we invaded, obviously in Iraq. So I think that's those are things I would do, uh, and I would just look for weak points in the coalition that that that, it, that it we're putting together and try to slowly kind of create uh, some discord between them, peel them off, raise the costs where appropriate. And then I might, you know, I mean, on the one hand, I, I think it's probably good for ISIS not to attack the U.S. homeland by sponsoring <laughs> terrorist attacks, Indeed. but that might be another you know, strategy, you know. Uh, what I find most impressive about ISIS is actually their information operation strategy, uh, which is, is good enough, virulent enough, uh, that they are convincing 17-year-old uh, Coloradan young ladies to travel to Turkey to, to, to join the fight in Syria, right? We, uh, the same strategy has worked for British young ladies. So, so um, the, the um, specter of uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of Western passport holding Jihad University graduates for the long haul for a generation to come is is um, is the strategic threat posed by ISIS, as is the the radicalization of people who never leave our shores uh, again over the internet and and so um, uh, I think their their information operation strategy is enormously effective and extremely worrying and and we need to be paying a lot more attention to that yesterday. Yeah. But what do we do about it? Right. Well, and and here, here you get yeah. into really interesting civil liberties questions, right? And, and that, that balance, I'm afraid, is going to swing um, as, as more attacks happen because they inside may, our borders. They may have a great social media strategy, but everybody they're appealing to is on social media, and that actually is very good for law enforcement. Right. I mean, so, it, you know, I, you know it, it, I, we, we, we have a database of all the jihadi terrorism cases that we maintain here, and, and every, without exception, except people in their mid-40s who've been attracted by ISIS, everybody's got very active social media profile, which has turned out to be very useful for the government. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's the, yeah, they had this great ability, but at the same time, it's sort of a double-edged sword. I, I kind of think we have to go through a process now where the U.S. people don't want real, large numbers of U.S. troops on the ground. Yeah. So we have to you see how this indirect approach works. Hopefully, it will have some success, uh, and we have to go through that process, I think, before anyone's going to be willing to suggest more troops over there in a substantial way. Colonel Rayburn. So, uh, John, about knife fights. Um, obviously, so in terms of uh, uh, the de there's been the long-running debate about counterinsurgency um, doctrine, counterinsurgency and practice inside the U.S. military and military intellectuals. And I know you've been involved in that debate. But zooming out from that, this book in particular, what, what was the intellectual debate that you hoped to, this book would enter into um, most cogently? Was it the counterinsurgency debate or was it something else? I mean, what, what do you most want intellectually in terms of the marketplace of ideas? Where did you want to place this book? So th the intellectual heart of the book is the last chapter, Counterinsurgency Revisited. Uh, play on Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited. Uh, <laughs> where, where similar but different. Similar but different. <laughs> where, where I, yes. Um, 
no turtles with diamonds. Um, and, and it was an argument for fewer American interventions. So I, I did not support the Libyan intervention. Mm. Um, the, the only wars that I think have been necessary um, since, since Desert Storm have been uh, the uh, invasion of uh, Afghanistan, the broader uh, global war against Al Qaeda, largely conducted with drone strikes and intelligence, and now the current war against ISIS, which is only necessary because we mishandled the end uh, of an unnecessary war, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. So if, if I have a, a plea, it is fewer interventions conducted only when the U.S. has a vital national interest at stake, and the U.S. has to have first an end state for, for what it wants to achieve, and it has to be willing to invest in achieving that end state, a very, uh, which is a generational project in the kind of wars that I foresee for the future. And so the U.S. has to have the capability to do that while uh, taking that capability out of its scabbard as seldom as it possibly can. So it's a kind of a conflation of the power doctrine and the Petraeus uh, approach. But um, is there a sort of problem? They may be hard to square. The power doctrine works really well against an enemy where you can just sort of defeat them and you have a, it's, it's hard, you know. The, the hard part is, is giving politicians an appetite suppressant. Right. This is bad. Somebody should do something. We're somebody. This is something. Let's do it. Yeah. Right. And, and, and Libya, I think, is the best single example of this, mm. t the, that, that this administration, in the wake of Iraq, this administration which came to power because of the mishandling of the uh, uh, aftermath, bungled aftermath of the invasion of Iraq in 2003, had no plan for what it would do after it toppled Gaddafi, right, is is an indication that this is an equal opportunity problem. Right, this is a, uh, right, you're not going to see a more bellicose administration than that of George W. Bush. You're not going to see, I don't think, a more pacific administration uh, in philosophy than Barack Obama's, right? Both administrations relied on the use of military force to get rid of an immediate problem without any plan for the long-term solution. That's, that's the problem I really want to get at. All the way back, sir. Behind you, Courtney. Oh, sorry. Oh, Kevin had one. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Peter. I started to worry about my rotator cuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve Luckett, thanks for the uh, thanks for the form today. Um, I guess sort of picking up on our last conversation, uh, Colonel. Um, could you give us a survey of uh, the the need for an updated AUMF, specifically the associated forces component? Mm -hmm. And building on that, and uh, the remark by your uh, your colleague up there to the extent that there might be some level of war weariness, but there is a need for um, kinetic action. Could you look at the use of um, joystick jockeys and spec ops teams in, in helping essentially to continue what Dexter Filkins calls um, the forever war? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Right. Dexter's book, uh, one of many very good ones uh, on these wars. Um, I have... Um, Michael Hirsch has a, a pretty tough piece out in uh, Politico uh, criticizing the administration's national security team today. Uh, in it, he says that uh, a national security advisor, uh, Rice, uh, requested the repeal of the authorization for the use of military force uh, earlier this year. Uh, the, the Pentagon said, oh, we need that. Uh, and, and that request was pulled. She sent that to the Senate. That request was pulled back. And we are now, of course, operating in Iraq under the terms of the authorization for the use of military force, which is one of the most flexible documents in uh, recent American history. We have stretched that bad boy pretty <laughs> far, uh, in, in fact, to use it now against an organization which was expelled from Al uh, the, auth the mm -hmm. authorization allows us to use force against Al Qaeda. Uh, the Islamic State was, of course, expelled from Al Qaeda for being too violent, which is impressive in and of itself. Right? And, and so, yes, I would like to see uh, a, a um, renewed legal authority for that. Uh, I think that there is no appetite for doing that in the Senate. Uh, I also, uh, or the House, uh, I, uh, particularly now, it's, it's, right, it's November of a, almost November of an even numbered year. Uh, but but um, there's also no, no real opposition to the use of force against the Islamic State uh, in either House of Congress, despite <coughs> the supposed war weariness of the American people. If anything, the criticism the administration has taken, as from the Washington Post today, is that they're not taking this fight seriously enough. Uh, uh, my hope is that they will begin to do so in the near future. 
the gentleman here. And, and this will um, we'll get grab a question there as well as we go. We'll get take two together. Follow up if I could. A bonus round uh, on economic development, the role of economic development in Iraq, Afghanistan, but also in, in the in globally, right? So we don't have to fight so many insurgencies and and uh, troublemakers around the world. Paul Brinkley was brought in by Gordon England and everyone back at the, you know back in two thousand six or seven, helped build businesses. So the economic angle on development. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I, I, let's get this. Well, we're running out of time, so let's mm -hmm. get to take another question here. In the week after the Blackwater convictions, could you comment on the use of uh, outsourcing to private contractors? Do you want to start with that? Or? Sure. Um, so the, the, ro the role of outsourcing to private military contractors. Um, we had far fewer troops uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan together uh, uh, at the same time than we, than we had uh, in Vietnam. A big part of the reason for that is that we outsourced a lot of the functions previously performed by uniformed military in Vietnam. Uh, vast majority of the logistical support and, and some of even of the trigger pulling duties uh, we, we outsource to contractors. I, I have far fewer problems outsourcing logistics to contractors. I think that's a very wise move given the, the uh, expense of the all volunteer force. Uh, the, the most costly uh, people the government ha has are, are government employees. Contractors are significantly cheaper. Uh, you can, it's easier to, to expand and shrink that force. Even uh, though the contractors may be on. getting paid more. Even though the contractors may be getting paid more for that particular year, uh, the, right, the, the pension costs, right. the health care costs, all that right. sort of stuff right, that, that, that accrue to, to government workers over the long term. Uh, I, I have real problems with, with putting government contractors in, in shoot, no shoot situations. How about um, intelligence? Um, in, in intelligence gathering, I'm fine. In intelligence analysis, I'm fine in uh, drone pulling, drone trigger pulling. I think that's inherently governmental function. I think, I, I think that that, is, that should be reserved to US government employees. You know, the, uh, the Brinkley office was a, a heck of a story. You know, the, the office was essentially created to help the Iraqi and Afghan economies sort of do, you know, do a survey of them and help them stand up and be more viable. And one of their greatest sort of bureaucratic components was the United States Agency for Inter International Development mm -hmm. and the State Department. You know, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of that, those, that particular office came out of Secretary Rumsfeld's efforts. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's good that it's at DOD because it's, you know, politically has more cover, but really, in a way, a lot of ways, it shouldn't be there. Um, I, I think that, that, that's sort of like the third or fourth, if it's ever something that people think of when they, we, we intervene in a country, is how can they have a, a fiscally economic, you know, economy that's sustainable for their, our strategy there and for their strategy once we depart. Uh, I think that's, it was an excellent office. They did a heck of a job surveying the private economies of Iraq and Afghanistan. They helped rediscover or discover, depending on how you look at it, the fact that Afghanistan has between you know, one to four trillion dollars worth of minerals and other things, the natural gas fields in the north of the country, and a, you know, a viable ec economy in a lot of ways, but still you know, work in progress. So I, I think that's not ever talked about much, and I don't know who the bureaucratic advocate for that is typically. It's usually this military, the, the diplomats, and USAID kind of weighing in, intel weighing in. The Department of Commerce is nowhere to be seen. U.S. trade reps nowhere to be seen. And so I thank God that office is there, but you know it's not. It's kind of personality dependent. You know, Brink is departed, so we don't really hear much of it now. Gentleman here. Hi, I'm Jamil Khan, a graduate student at Johns Hopkins Science. Um, if we look at history, we see that powerful Western militaries have been unable to defeat weaker groups from. Algeria to Vietnam to Afghanistan and even in Iraq today. So one way to look at this trend is a quote from a Vietnamese, um, a Vietnamese general who said, you are eventually going to go home and we are going to stay. So I guess in that light, what does victory look like in Iraq militarily and politically from a Western perspective, knowing that we will eventually go home? Uh, so, so success in Iraq in my eyes is a, a, a government that, that has the, the nominal support of all of the Iraqi people that, that successfully transitions democratically uh, without, without widespread violence as the Iraqi government just has um, and, and that, that is ultimately sovereign, that is, has a uh, monopoly on the legitimate use of force inside its borders. I, I believe that uh, that was within our grasp in 2011. We, we pulled defeat from the jaws of victory, uh, defining that as victory uh, by pulling out all, all American forces. I believe that it is, it is not too late uh, to, to regain that, although doing so will require the, uh, uh, more expenditure of, of lives, American and Iraqi, uh, and uh, more American 
and Iraqi treasure. The, the, um, the, the fact is that the United States doesn't have to leave. Right? As we've demonstrated in Germany, Italy, Japan, Korea, uh, if it is important enough, if ground is important enough for America to bleed on it, it is important enough for Americans to stay there so that the next generation of Americans doesn't have to bleed on it again. All right, it's a, a lesson we failed to learn, uh, failed to follow during the First World War. We got it right after the second. Um, and unfortunately, we got it wrong again in Iraq in 2011. Or one of my highest hopes is that we're we now having reintroduced American boots on the ground in Iraq, that we don't forget it again. Or, or there will be a fourth Iraq war in my lifetime. We're going to take one more question. Uh, hi, I'm Don Krauss with Citizens for Global Solutions. So most of this conversation has been particularly from a U.S. military perspective, which makes sense based upon the <laughs> book. But more and more, the conflicts that the U.S. is asked to engage in are conflicts where we're working with coalitions of other countries. We're asking locals on the ground to play a greater role on them. Uh, the, you know, when we're thinking about the, the aftermath of these things, um, you know, we're talking about the United States presence over the long term, but we're seeing situations like Kosovo and others where there's other countries also in, engaged in that process as well. Do you see a need for greater institutional building of capacities for interoperability between countries so that when these situations come up, we're not reinventing the wheel each and every time, in each and every conflict, reinventing the coalition and putting it all back together again? Great. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, you know, and, and I think in an era where we're unwilling to send troops overseas more increasingly and where a lot of conflicts take place in countries that never reach the threshold of conventional war, you know, that privileges uh, deep subject matter expertise. It also privileges a long-term perspective. Um, and also, to do the strategy well, you need to have some sort of uh, visibility at a bureaucratic level much higher than those countries typically get. Um, you know, for example, when um, is that Brennan was in charge of our, our Yemen policy. He was you know, a stone's throw from the president's office, so Yemen got a lot of attention. But once he departed, it's, you know, it's an afterthought. Of course, other crises have bubbled up, but you know, this, is a tr this is replicated again and again and again in countries like this. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that kind of uh, ability to work with other partners is central, but you know, we keep forgetting that we have the U U.S. Army Special Forces, you know, which were expressly designed to deal with these small wars, so to speak and to kind of privilege the ability to work well with partner countries. You know, and they reach all the way up to the general officer level. You know, I think that's an institution that won't, often doesn't get as much attention as it needs. And you know, I think that's a place to look for uh, doing this better in the future. So I actually wrote my senior thesis at West Point on armaments cooperation in NATO with just the, the Cold War was still hot then. I actually wrote it on a corner of then Major Petraeus' desk. Petraeus was the speechwriter for Jack Galvin and the Supreme Allied Commander Europe. So I've been thinking about ways to, to increase uh, uh, cooperation, uh, interoperability for, for 30 years, for a, a very long time. Interestingly, there's a, a piece in the uh, Navy Marine Corps Times just today uh, stating that the U.S. Uh, unwilling, uh, because of administration policy, to put American boots on the ground uh, inside uh, Iraqi Kurdish frontline battalions, uh, where, where they're, they're exposed to direct combat, is looking for local partner countries to do that. It is my belief that uh, in that particular case and in the broader case, America's allies will be willing to follow, but only if America leads. And, and uh, uh, certainly in the case of the current war, we have not yet shown real determination to do what needs to be done to defeat what I believe is a clear and present and growing threat, uh, not just to the United States, but to our allies around the globe. Well, on that note, uh, we want to thank Dr. Nagel, Dr. Green, uh, for a very interesting presentation. And I'm sure Dr. Nagel will be willing to sign books uh, shortly outside. Thank, thank you all for coming.